Hello, everyone. I would like first to thank the member of the jury for accepting to participate to this PhD defense. For me today, it's a great honor to share with you this work and defend my PhD thesis, PhD thesis of title, Experimental Testing of Masonry Structures Subjected to Extreme Loads and Specifically Explosion. Under supervision of Professor Jan Stefano, Professor Panos Kotronis, and Dr. Filippo Masi, I would like also to acknowledge the help of Professor Guillaume Asino and Engineer Emmanuel Marché with the explosive source. This thesis is funded by the Connectelo project of Pedro Alois and Nantes Metropole. Well, the story, the story started a long time ago before my thesis, where our structure has been subjected to easier accidental or deliberated explosion. <clears throat> We have the Parthenon in 1687, where the biggest part of the Parthenon collapsed. More recently, Beirut explosion 2020. So let me start from the end. This is kind of work that we do. Our objective is to break and destroy things in laboratory rather than in real life. Now let's get more serious. Our objective is to study the fast dynamic response and failure mechanism of a structure subjected to blast scenarios experimentally. But experiments at full scale are not repeatable, expensive, laborious, and considered for a part of structure. Moreover, it required special testing area with restricted access and safety hazards. And instead, doing experiment at a reduced scale will offer us high degree of repeatability and control, uh, moderate cost, and, and also reduced hazard associated with the experiment. Experiment at reduced scale are considered focusing on studying shockwave propagation inside a confined structure, not in testing structural response, which is what we do here. So we are the first to study the structural response of reduced scale structure subject to explosion. So how we do that? Well, first we need to design an experimental setup that capable us to study the response of structure at reduced scale in the laboratory. This is will be will followed by study the explosive source and the associated blast parameters. Then we need to validate the scaling law by comparing the response of full scale structure against the reduced scale. And finally, as a proof of concept, we need to do a, an experiment for a model that it is based on real uh, structures. When we speak about explosion, we have in our mind all these kinds of images. In 4 August 2020, a three kiloton of ammonia nitrate stored at the port of Beirut, the capital city of Lebanon, exploded, and the explosion led to hundreds of deaths and hundreds of thousands of people left homeless. So when we speak about explosion, there is a rapid, a rapid release of energy in the form of compressed gas that rapid release into the atmosphere and produce a shockwave. Now, if we are going to measure the pressure coming from this explosion or any other type of uh, explosion, the pressure have the following signature. Imagine that this explosion, it is catastrophic, that it's responsible for changing the atmosphere of the Earth. And this, it doesn't happen in one hour or one minute, but in less than one second. So we are dealing here with catastrophic phenomena and the challenge is to simulate this explosion in the laboratory but before going to that, let me uh, give you some suspect related to the loading condition. So the, the shock wave produced from our explosion, it's what we name it as incident overpressure. So it is overpressure, it is differential pressure. It is the pressure of the shock wave minus the atmospheric pressure. Now this, this shock wave will propagate and at a certain point, it will strike the target and our structure will feel what we call reflected overpressure. This is due to the conservation of momentum. And the value of this reflected overpressure can be 10 times greater than the incident one. We define here also the incident impulse, which is the area below the, the curve, which is the integral of pressure in time. So now here we move to the, uh, to the platform. We have two parts, the design and the installation. And now we'll start by the design part. Here is the platform that we have so far, and the design steps are as follows. We have first to deal with the explosive source and the associated components. I will give you more details about this later. The metrology, which has to deal with the philosophy and the reasoning behind our data acquisition system, sensors that we need to use in order to measure our signal and structural response. 
And then this will follow it by studying the structural prototyping and the optical table. And finally, for sure, we need to assure the environmental safety. So, so let's go into the detail of this component. So for the explosive source, we use an exploding wire and the system is composed of the pulse current generator, a cable, and an exploding wire, which is a wire installed between two electrodes, cathodes and anodes. And the explosion mechanism, it is as following. When a sufficiently large amount of charge is discharged uh, through a thin wire that made of uh, copper, gold, aluminum, this wire will undergo the rapid increase in temperature. So due to this rapid increase of temperature, the wire will undergo a phase transition and it will generate a shock wave, pressure shock wave. Now for the metrology, which is composed of the sensors, and here we did uncertainty analysis on order to show the sensor that's suitable to measure our, our signal and with sensor with low, uh, with low uncertainties. Moreover, we use different type of sensor to measure the reflected incident over pressure. Now, all these sensor will be connected to a data acquisition system that is placed outside the cabin in a control room, noting that this data acquisition device, it should be fast enough with enough resolution in order to measure the signal coming from the sensor in order not to lose our measurements. Moreover, I did the design of lab view code in order to control reading, writing, and visualizing data also for later post-processing of our signal. And we use also cameras in order to measure the structural response. Third part, which is related to the structural fabrication optical table. Now, since it's not possible to do our experiment on lab floor, since it's not well aligned and we cannot install our uh, data acquisition and system sensors. So instead we decided to use an optical table an optical table, which is a, is a rigid surface that is used on uh, an optical measurements and sensitive experiment or experiment with highly applied load in order to perform a rigid and stable surface. In our experiment, the optical table, it is designed specifically to withstand the explosion load and to perform a rigid surface for our structure. Moreover, for structure fabrication, we refer here to two types of technologies that we use. FDM, which is fused filament deposition, and SLA stereography. And finally, for the environmental safety, now we decided to do our experiment inside a container cabin. This will allow us to isolate our experiment from the surrounding. Moreover, inside this container cabin, we decided to we did the installation of acoustic foam that will help us into. Uh, uh, to dampen the sound coming from the explosion and to prevent the reflection of the pressure inside the cabin. Moreover, for more safety, we did the installation of a ventilation system that will take all the, which is composed of two parts, air extraction and ventilation, in order to, to eliminate and take all the metal dust coming from the wire during, after the explosion to assure the environmental safety. And from that, now we move to the installation part. I should insist on the fact that the design and installation took from me around two years of meticulous research and studies in order to assemble all the components related to the experimental platform. So I did the installation by myself and with the help of engineer Emmanuel Marche. I would like also to acknowledge the help of my colleagues that they helped me when needed and for example, during the installation of the cabin. So here it is the cabin that we have so far, and here is inside the cabin. So in this part, we did our first objective, which is to design this platform, mini blast, in order to study later structural response. So now we move to the second part of this presentation, which is related to the explosive source. And I will start by the electrical system, here we'll go into the details of the mechanism of the explosion and we'll see the evolution of the current and the voltage in our system circuit. So what we have here is that we have a wire and we discharge a thousand of voltage that pass through this wire. The wire will act as a fuse and it will explode. During this, the following mechanism take place. So we start the discharge and the developed current heat up the wire and due to ohmic heating uh, until the wire it melts. At melts, we, the discharge current continue and uh, the temperature increase faster. This will lead to the formation of andaloid. 
Now, at this stage, the apparent resistance of the wire increase further. Due to that, the air between the undulate is not a good uh, conductor. And now, at this stage, the current will continue to discharge. We'll have the electrical breakdown. And the current will continue to discharge in the form of an electric arc, which is microelectric arc. It's a plasma. And the plasma will expand along and around the wire. The previous, all the previous stages will be accompanied by the formation of pressure shock waves that will propagate outward the wire. Now, we don't, uh, now uh, we, uh, this is the phenomenon and the mechanism that, uh, that we think that might happen in our system. Now, we don't have the mean in order to measure this optically, but however, what we want to do is to measure the evolution of the current and voltage inside our circuit, inside the wire. So here is the circuit that we have. And we, what we store, we store energy inside the capacitor and we discharge as I explained before. So we conduct three experiment by measuring the discharge current as function of time in our circuit. And we measured the voltage as function of time at, which is the, the voltage here, it is the pot potential difference that measured at the wire extremities and we denote it here as voltage. Now, what we want to do is that we want to link the current and voltage signal uh, in order to the previous mechanisms that have happened before. And for that, we here plotted the current and voltage as function of time. And what I will do next is that I will divide the signal into uh, to the points where there is a changes in the signal happen. For that, we define here point one, which is associated with the start of the discharge, point two, which is associated with the voltage peak, and point three, which is associated with the current peak. We do fit to the current and voltage in order to smooth out any regularities in order to better understand our signal. And we plot here the current as function of voltage. The IV plot is important because it gives us the, the slope of this plot. It is the conductance. And the inverse of the conductance is it is, it is the resistance. So from this plot, we are able to see the evolution of our resistance and our circuit as function of the current and voltage. So here it is point one for us. As I explained before, we start the discharge. And as you can see, when we, when we are discharging the, and the slope of uh, decrease, which means the resistance increase and we continue to charge and the resistance increase farther and farther until we reach point two, which is here the maximum resistance that we reach in our system, which is this associated with the electrical breakdown in our, that happened in our circuit. So between one and two, we have the stages of formation of andeloids and the electrical breakdown. We continue discharge current. As you can see here now, the, uh, the slope increase and uh, the resistance decrease. As we are now going to discharge in the form of electric arcs, which is followed by the formation of the shock wave. So in this part, we, we, I showed the mechanism related to the explosion and we showed that in terms of the evolution of the current and voltage. From this part, we move to the shockwave analysis. Now in this part, what we want to do is that we want to analyze the signal, the shockwave, by measuring the pressure distribution for different energy for different distance. Uh, we want to study also the shockwave sparsity and later we want to derive the TNT equivalence. The first step toward shockwave measurement or signal measurement is to verify the accurate capturing of the signal. For that, we placed a pressure transducer at distance D from the explosion source, which is now we want to measure the incident of a pressure, and we conducted three experiments. Here, as you can see, experiment one, the incident over a pressure as function of time. Here is experiment two, and here is experiment three. As you can see from here that our signal are highly repeatable. Moreover, we measure this signal with sampling frequency or sampling resolution five mega simple per second. What we want to do is that we want to verify that this sampling resolution is sufficient and enough in order to capture our signal. For that, we take here experiment two as an example. And more specifically, we want to be sure that we capture very well the peak. By making zoom on the peak, we can see that we see several points that we capture at the rise and the peak of the shock wave, which means that we are sufficiently capturing our shock wave 
and this sampling frequency is sufficient for our measurement. Moreover, we can see that the form, the, we can see that we measure what we expected in terms of the pressure signature between the ideal pressure signature and our signal. From here, we go to start analyzing our and characterizing our source by measuring the incident of pressure at different distance and for different energy levels stored inside the capacitor. So here I'm showing, for example, at distance 30 centimeters, the incident over pressure as function of time for different energy level. The incident, uh, the incident impulse is calculated based on the experimental data of the incident, uh, uh, incident over pressure, which is as following. And now what we can see from here is that as we increase the energy stored inside the capacitor, the value of a pressure and the value of impulse increases as well. We define here the scale distance ZE as function of the D, which is the distance between our sensor and the explosion source and the cube root of energy. The scale distance ZE will allow us to predict the load applied at full scale from the measurement of the reduced scale. It is referred as hopkinson kranz scaling or the cube root scaling. This law will allow us, in case that we have a typical explosive with different charge mass, to, to simulate the load based on the cube root of energy. So, moreover, we assume here that, in order to calculate the ZE, that the energy stored inside the capacitor is totally dissipated and converted into pressure. So, we have here our blast parameters, and we want to plot them as function of ZE. And specifically, we plot here PSO as function of ZE, the incident impulse as function of ZE, and the arrival time as function of ZE. What we can see from here is that our blast parameters scales linearly with ZE, which is very important. Moreover, putting our data in terms of ZE will allow us to compare our blast parameters with other typical explosive materials, as we are discussing here about the internal energy. Now, for shockwave spherosity or shockwave shape, measuring and understanding the shockwave shape will allow a different distance, will allow us to understand the pressure load applied on our structure when it's placed at different distance. To measure the shockwave, we, we measure the pressure, which is pressure distribution, which is we can interpret it as the shockwave shape at different distance. So we measure at two distances here, 30 centimeter and 50 centimeter. We placed the pressure uh, transducer with different angle. Moreover, to increase the spatial resolution of our measurement, we placed two uh, pencil uh, probe at the same time. And we measure also the pressure from the top. And as a result, we can see that at distance 30 centimeter, our pressure is almost spherical. It is hemispherical with minor differences at the boundaries, which is due to the effect of the, of the electrodes here. And at distance 50 centimeter, which is, we can see that it's almost hemispherical. Now we move to the last part in this, uh, which is related to the equivalency with TNT. Different explosive source will lead to different plus parameters, even with the same explosive mass M. In such a case, we calculate what we donate MTNT equivalence. TNT is used as reference for uh, with other explosive material due to its well-established blast parameters and consistent behavior. Moreover, there is a lot of uh, parameters and experiment uh, data related to explosion from TNT. Now, to calculate the TNT equivalence, here first we take the data that we, we measured from the previous and what calculate for the ZE, and I put here the experimental data, PSO as function of ZE. Here it is for TNT. Now the TNT, it is the best fit interpolation of, uh, uh, of experimental data from Pingali and Bulmish. And now, and for, for ZE, we assume that all the internal energy of TNT, it is converted and dissipated into, uh, into, uh, into pressure. What we can see from this plot is that two things. First of all, we have an offset between the PSO TNT and PSO experimental data. Now, if we, we, uh, if we go into more details, what we can see is that we don't have a constant offset as we change ZE. 
So that means that here the equivalence or we have different offset as which is the offset is dependent of the scale distance. Also, we can see that from the incident impulse here, our experimental data, and here is the TNT, and we can see that we have different offset, uh, which is uh, as function of ZD. Now, indeed, if we go for other explosive, uh, type, typical explosive, we can see that none of them has a real TNT equivalence, which means the TNT equivalence, it is dependent on the scaled distance. In order to operate to this condition, what we are going to do is that we are going to calculate the TNT equivalence that it is dependent on the scale distance ZD. How we do that? Well, first we prefer on the TNT equivalence that based on the incident over pressure, PSO, and it is calculated as following. So let's take the following example where we have, as I explained before, PSO ZD for TNT and for our experimental data. And for the same value of PSO, we have ZE related to our experimental data from exploding wire, and ZE TNT divided by ZE TNT power three, we calculate the equivalence factor. And here it is the result. The equivalence factor as function of ZE, and we can see from here that we have different equivalence factors that it is dependent on the scale distance ZE. Now what we want to do finally is that to calculate the equivalent TNT mass, as shown here, and here it is the MTNT equivalence as function of ZE for different energy levels stored inside our capacitor. And we can see that our TNT equivalence is varied between few milligrams into 270 milligram. Now calculating this MTNT equivalence will allow us to model our plus parameters based on the knowledge of the TNT. Now in this part, we analyze the shock wave and the associated plus parameters and we studied the shockwave sphericity and here finally the TNT equivalence. Now we move to the third part of this presentation, which is we want to do first experiment or first validation related to, uh, by studying the structure, structure rigid, rigid response of structure subjected to explosion. But before, let me introduce you the scaling law. The scaling law, it is based on simulated theory that provides a condition to design, to design reduced scale structure model from the knowledge of full scale structure prototype and to predict the prototype response from the model results. The following assumption uh, we base in order to uh, base on mass et al to calculate and derive the scaling law. First of all, the rigid body response our structure will be subjected to blast load and will undergo a rigid body response. Therefore, the deformation is assumed to be negligible with respect to the rigid body motion. This assumption is realistic considering structure with low confinement. Related to blast load, the blast load is assumed to act simultaneously and uniformly on the impinged surface. Moreover, we assume that our load is impulsive this is due to fact that the characteristic time of our structure is uh, much greater than the characteristic time of our load, which is two order of magnitude. And the three, the friction and the gravity between the model and the prototype is assumed to be the same. And from this assumption, Massey et al calculated two scaling factors, geometric scale factor lambda and density scale factor gamma. And based on that, we calculate the scaling factor for rigid body response. So we have here lambda t, which is the scale factor for time response. Now in order, uh, which is here we plot lambda t as function of lambda, the geometric scale factor. In order to understand this, let's take the following example, where we have here the Pisa tower, the prototype. If we take lambda one over 100, which is here almost here is the model, so now if the response time of the prototype is one second, by taking lambda one over 100, the response time of the model will become 0 0.1 second. So the structure response at reduced scale become faster. Moreover, we scale the impulsive loading applied on our structure, lambda i, also as function of geometry, which is impulsive loading decrease. And by changing the density or, and the type of the material, we also decrease more our load that applied at reduced scale. So here, what we have is that we have 
the prototype and we have here the model and we want to validate the response to be validated through rocking mechanism. The model and uh, the two blocks are printed by using FTM technology with lambda equal to 0 0.5 the model and gamma equal to one. And here is the characteristic of the prototype and the model. We have this, uh, we here is the geometry and the density, which is the same between the model and the prototype. And here is the friction, which is the mean value or value of the five measurements. The friction here, it is the contact between the block and the table. And now we kept the same uh, W between the, the same weights between the prototype and the model, because here we want to focus on studying 2D out of plan response uh, rocking mechanism, as this will allow us in order to avoid reflection and deflection that happens at the edges of the of the block. Moreover, we want to minimize minimize the sliding and uplifting, and this by, by we introduced two bars that will prevent the block from undergoing the sliding at the bottom. So what we want to do here is we want to measure the structural response, and more specifically, we want to. Uh, to do particle tracking volumetry, we want to track particles through consecutive frames. And for that, we refer to stereometry or stereo vision, which is involved uh, uh, using two or more cameras in order to capture the, uh, the field from different view for later reconstruction of the 3D field and calculate the lens parameters like focal length and pixel size. For that, we use GoPro cameras, as you can see here. Now, remember, as I told you before, is that we are focusing here on studying the structural response and based on the characteristic time of our structure with, go, with uh, FPS equal 240, we are able to capture the structural response. Moreover, GoPro, it is cheap, robust, and we can use multiple cameras in order to capture the, the field from different points. The only downside, it is uh, lens distortion, but no problems as we are going to calibrate the cameras and calculate the uh, distortion parameters. So we do here PTB analysis by using TMA Classic software. And as I said before, we track particles, we track the centroid of these particles through consecutive frames in order to measure the displacement. In our measurement, we have an upper bound error or resolution of value 0.112 millimeter. In order to, to be sure about this upper bound error or resolution for our uh, measurements, let's take the following example. Here we have the distance between point P1 and P3, which is about 80 millimeter. And here we plot the distance between P1 and P3 as function of time history. And as you can see from here that the, the variation of this distance, it's belong our upper bound error, which is verifies the resolution of our measurements. <clears throat> so let's see finally now the rocking. Here it is for the prototype. And we can see from here the application of the bars that prevent the sliding of the block. And here it is for the model. Now we move to the results and first of all related to the prototype. Now what we want to be sure is that the structural response is repeatable and we want to be sure about the verification of the application of the bars. So for that, we conducted three experiments. Here I'm showing the displacement U1 as function of time for experiment one, experiment two, and experiment three. You can see from here that the structural response is highly repeatable. Moreover, if we we look at the residual displacement that we have in our plot, uh, plot which is, it's belong to the spatial resolution, which is verifies that we have a negligible sliding in our plot, which means a good application of the bar. Moreover, if we consider now the displacement of the outer plan motion, which is in direction U3, as function of time, we can see that it is belong to our spatial resolution. And from here, we can see that we have 2D motion in X1 and X2 di direction where you see it's negligible. And now from here, we go to, co to compare the result between the model and the prototype. 
And more specifically, we want to compare the result in U1 direction where the major displacement happened. Now, noting that in order to avoid the upscaling of the uncertainties due to the spatial resolution, we decided to downscale the result of the prototype. So here it is, the result displacement U1, function of time for the prototype. And here it is for the, for the model, and here it is for the prototype. Now, these two curves, they should coincide and fit to each other, but they, they didn't, as we can see here. But still, we can see that the first oscillation, we have similar initial amplitude between the model and the prototype, which is probably it is the most difficult part to have it because it has to deal with the loading condition and the scaling of the impulsive loading between the prototype and the model. However, we can see that we lose after that, that we have different damping and different oscillation period between the model and the prototype, and which means we have different dissipation between the two blocks. Now, we attribute these uh, differences in dissipation due to the application as a contact with the bar and the block, which is we assume that it is lead to more dissipation and different dissipation between the model and the prototype. In order to better understand this problem and to clarify it, we refer to the example by, uh, provided by Hausner to calculate the restitution coefficient. So let's take the following example. We have a block and we shift the block by a certain inclination angle theta, and we lift the block that will undergo a free rocking. Now, assuming that the friction, which is the contact between the block and the ground, it's high enough, so the block will not undergo the sliding, but just rocking around the pivotal point O prime and O. In order now to calculate the restitution coefficient, we, by equating the moment of momentum around point O prime, just before the impact to just after the impact, we have the following equation of motion. And from that, we calculate the restitution coefficient. We can see that the restitution coefficient, it is dependent on alpha, the slender's angle, which means it is based on the geometry. And now in our experiment, we have the following problems. First of all, the block edges are not perfect, which is due to the, it has to deal with the resolution of our printing where the block is, is as following, where the perfect case alpha it should be like that, while what we have is different value of alpha, which means it's need to have different restitution coefficient of what we should have. Moreover, we have a friction with the support, which is the contact here between the bar and the block, which is responsible also for dissipating energy as the block rock between the two points O and O prime. And also we can see it here clearly. Moreover, we, we might have a small sliding that occurs at the base, which is, as you can see here, that it might also be responsible of having also a dis dissipating energy in our system. Now, if we calculate the, based on the rocking equation, the rocking period for the first, uh, first oscillation, we can see that the rocking period, it is depending on the R, the slender length, and alpha also. So for the same problem that explained before, we expect also that we have different periods that will lead also to different dissipation of energy. So in order to be more convincing, let's see what we could expect in the ideal and the perfect uh, scenario and what we have in, from our experiment. So by solving the, here is the theoretical results. By solving the rocking equation, we have the displacement U1 as function of time. This is what we expected initially for the prototype, and this is what we got. Now here's saying for the model, here is the theoretical or what we expected, and here is what we got. We can see that in the prototype and the model, we have different uh, different restitution coefficient and different period and different dissipation of energy, which is we attributed to due to this contact between the bar and the block. And now we are confident that if we remeasure the, the blocks and the bar with higher precision, by using different uh, printer, we are sure that we are able to eliminate this problem and thus to get what we expect. And from here, we move to the last part of this presentation, which is related to the uh, proof of concept. We want to study the part in uh, response at reduced scale in the laboratory. So here it is the plan of the partenum, and here it is the 3D section of the partenum. 
we we printed the the part in by using SLA technology with lambda one over seventy, and for this value of gamma. And after a meticulous amount of work uh, from our experiment and designing and printing around five thousand blocks, that we designed it block by block and building them one by one. Here it is the result where we have the part in on. Here it is the west champ. Here we have the silla champ, the architrave, the wall. Here we have 12 internal Doric column, 46 external Doric column. And here it is the explosion location where we installed our electrodes. Here is a view from west, and here is a view we can, where we can see also the architrave and the columns. Now for the experimental setup and experimental preparation, in order to do later PTV analysis, we fixed three cameras. We placed also stickers, which is we are going to track later. And here is the explosion location, which is according to the literature, it is assumed that it happened at this location. Here it is the full scale. And from here, I'm happy to share with you that we unlock on the real behavior of the Parthenon, our laboratory. The response of the pattern here is less than one second. And here it is. So from here, I will give you an example uh, related to what we can do in a tracking. And for, for example, we are going now to track point P1 on the Scylla column. Noting that we are able here to track any visible point, any visible stickers here, and to calculate the, this as a velocity, the, the acceleration. But for simplicity, I'm going just to give this example where tracking the trajectory of this uh, cellar column, P, specifically point P1, uh, among the different frames. So here at zero, here at 12.5 millisecond. Here is the maximum position reach by the capital. Here we it goes down, down, and here is the minimum position. So here it is uh, just an example about what we can do with PTV and what kind of data that we can extract. And for sure, we are able to have the velocity isolation and to track any points that we want. Now, finally, we want to make a comparison between the model, the explosions that we did, and the full-scale part on the prototype. Now, noting that the current version of the Parthenon, it is restored in order to simulate the, 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 the Parthenon where after the explosion, according to Corus et al., which makes the comparison meaningful. So here, for sure, we'll see differences and we'll see similarities. So let's start by the differences. We can see that in our case, the column is still, it's not collapsed, while it is collapsed in the real case. Same for here, it is, doesn't collapse in our case. We can see here that it is collapsed in the full scale, but in our case, we can see that there is a motion. That means it just critically need bigger explosion and it will collapse. We can see here all the internal door column, it stays the same in our case and the full scale. And we have here similar explosion. Same for here, we have the collapse of the wall. And here, both of them, they stayed without collapse. So we are sure that two things, if we increase our explosion and if we combine our structure because the explosion happened in the prototype, it is happened with the, with the roof, which means confined explosion. So the partial failure from this roof will be responsible for making bigger collapse inside the other parts. So by, by solving these problems, we are sure that we are able to simulate the explosion that happened in the part, you know, but at reduced scale. From here, I will move to the conclusion. So the main objective of this thesis was to design a novel experimental platform, mini blast, to study the explosive source and the associated blast parameters, to validate the scaling law by comparing the result of the prototype and the model, and as a proof of concept to do experiment of model, which is a part in of ASIN at reduced scale. And here it is the main funding. We designed a novel experimental platform and we install it. We provide also the methodology and the reasoning behind the design and the installation. 
Moreover, we provide the details related to environmental safety and the philosophy behind choosing, choosing our data acquisition and devices that will capable us to accurately uh, measure our signal. For the explosive source, we, we get into the details of the explosion mechanism and we, we saw the current and voltage evolution that happened in, the, in the, our circuit. Moreover, we studied the pressure distribution by measuring the pressure at different distance for different energy. We studied the shockwave sphericity. Moreover, we derived the TNT equivalence that will allow us to model our parameters plus parameters based on the knowledge of TNT. And finally, to study the dynamic response of structure, the first experiment is done concerning the scaling law. And we studied the response of Parthenon at reduced scale. Now for the perspective and upcoming works, we want to do a parametric study for the explosive source. And specifically, we want to change the wire parameters by changing the length, the diameter, the material of the wire itself to measure the current, the voltage, the pressure. Moreover, we want to complete the validation of the scaling law and this by improving the printing of blocks by increasing the precision of our printing. Moreover, we want to print a new supports in order to avoid this problem that we have in the contact between the block and the bar. We want also to continue the study of the explosion of Parthenon by continuing by designing the roof and printing the roof. And we want for sure to answer the question about what happened in the explosion in 1687. And we're sure we can also to calculate the TNT equivalence we, and the estimated uh, explosions that happened at that time. And finally, we want to improve the resilience of modern structures. And I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>